Good evening and welcome to the College of Conferences. My name is Tim and I'll be kind of helping, me and Andy, I'll be helping moderate tonight along with our Andy Anderson. The College of Conferences consists of the following format. We have three speakers who are going to speak first. Then we're going to go into a question and answer period with those three speakers at the end of the question and answer period. And I would, again, encourage, ask a question and not give a statement because at the end of the question and answer period, you're each going to get a chance to rebut. Usually it's about a four minute rebuttal. We just order off the menu, right? Yes. Um, that's our format. Speakers will be the last word. We need to be out of here by quarter to nine uh, because the restaurant is closed at nine. Okay. We have a... Uh, Come on up. We've actually got introductions built in, don't worry. Okay. Got it covered. Well, let's welcome our speakers tonight. There's slides and everything. We've got slides and everything else. Yep. And uh, come on, let's give a rousing round of applause. Yay. Thanks, everybody. Yay. All right. I apologize. As usual, I'm going to present Ben uh, somewhat forward, so forgive the lunch. Okay. But um, thank you all for coming. We are the Greens for MWRD campaign, which is a slate of candidates from the Illinois Green Party running for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. And if you don't know what that is, that's okay. Stay tuned, you are in for a treat, because this is one of Chicago's most interesting and least reported on races. So we should have some fun stuff for you here tonight. We are happy to be guests of College Complex. Thank you for having us. Uh, any opinions expressed prior to this point are not the opinions of the Illinois Green Party or the Greens for MWRD campaign, but from here on out, it's on us. So, without further ado, let me show you where we're going to be going tonight. Just a quick framework for you. We're going to talk about what is the MWRD, what is the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. We're going to introduce uh, our candidates for that. There are actually five candidates. Three of us are here tonight. So we'll introduce ourselves and mention our other candidates for you as well. And then we're going to dive into the meat of this presentation, which is going to be talking about some of the problems at that district. We still got sound back there? Yeah, you got Okay, there we go. Some of the problems at that district and some of the solutions that the Green Party candidates are proposing for it. We'll talk to you a little bit about why 2018 is a unique electoral opportunity, a unique political opportunity. And we wouldn't be Greens who do everything by volunteer labor if we didn't ask you to get involved at the end. So that will be coming to forewarned is forearmed. Without further ado, let me bring Karen up here to talk to you about what is the MWRD. Karen, right. go ahead. Stay standing. Hello, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me. Bring it towards you. Get real close. It doesn't have much bigger. Hello? There you go. All right. Okay. All right. What is the MWRD? Um, here's a picture of one of the treatment plants. Uh, but I can assure you that everybody in this room has daily avails themselves of the services of this agency, the MWRD, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago is the agency that handles our wastewater. Every time you flush the toilet, every time you take a shower, every time you do laundry, you are sending water to the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District and in one of their seven treatment plants, that wastewater is then treated, released back into the environment, and we're gonna be talking more about what happens and why we're asking you to vote for us, why we're asking you to support us I'm going to go through a few basic facts. It is a taxpayer-funded civic agency that is responsible for wastewater treatment. And here's the other two functions, flood abatement and waterway quality testing in Cook County. They have approximately 2,000 employees across 10 different departments, including engineering, monitoring, and research, and legal. And it is run by a nine-member partisan elected board of commissioners. And this board has been exclusively Democrat democratic for at least 20 years and one of the reasons we as Green Party members have focused on this race because we do focus on this race is that we believe that that monopoly should be broken that power monopoly is not healthy for the citizens of the greater Chicago area by the numbers the infrastructure seven treatment plants 560 miles of tunnels and sewers 34 stormwater reservoirs, 22 pumping stations, 
and three no, like Michigan Gardens. They own over 9,500 acres of land, 76 miles of navigable waterways, and over 13,500 acres in Fulton County. The annual budget is over a billion, with an overall financial position of more than four billion in a given year. Uh, that would include things like capital improvement budgets over and above the operating budget, which is about 1.2 billion. And next up, what's next up? We're going to have introductions. And first, I want everyone to welcome Tammy Vinson, my fellow candidate. Hi again, uh, my name is Tammy Benson. Uh, I'm running as one of the uh, three six year uh, term folks. So we're going to go through introducing us. There are a picture of everyone who's involved in the Green Party slate. So the Illinois Green Party, it's a political organization. It's not uh, it's separate from the Democrats and the Republicans. It's the um, established in the state of Illinois because we've gotten uh, at least 5%, I think, of the votes in, in some of the separate elections. So that's why we are an established third party of Illinois. It's the only uh, party that does not take corporate donation. So all of our um, money comes from folks like you guys. So we have uh, four pillars that uh, the Green foundational pillars of the Green Party. One is grassroots democracy. Uh, we focus on social justice, economic wisdom, and nonviolence. So um, these are um, the folks that are running now. So the first person, we're doing this alphabetically, and Chris is not with us, but Chris Anthony is a resident of Pilsen. He's also uh, run for the um, Metropolitan Water Reclamation before. He's a community activist. He believes in air quality, green space, and some other good stuff. But in terms of his uh, MWRD plan, is advocating for uh, land leasing, protected and improving environmental standards for developers, and uh, guaranteeing public oversight of MWRD. And again, he's one of the uh, one of the five of us that's running for a six-year full term. Karen Luton, who has just spoke to you, is um, also another one of our uh, members who has run for this office before. She's a um, the Bush resident of the tenth tenth ward. She's a professor of mathematics, a community activist. She's uh, helped push for community gardens and green spaces and planted on vacant lots in the area where she lives in, which is Southeast Chicago. Karen will fight for stronger water, soil, and biosolid testing, uh, standards, and more transparent public disclosure. And she's another one of us running for a six-year term. <coughs> nice to meet Tammy. I live in uh, the Austin community. I'm a uh, public school teacher. I work at Oscar de Preach, which is in the Austin area. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of the Caucus of Rank and File Educators. There's the current leadership of CTU. I'm a member of that group, of uh, education activists, and I've been involved in a lot of local organizing in, in and around the West Side. So I believe that we should fight for more accessible, community-oriented, and citizen-accountable citizen, citizen accountable reclamation district. And uh, again, Karen, Anthony, and I are the three candidates are running for the six-year full term. So again, it's a nine-member board that I think we mentioned. So those three seats are, are up for re-election. Three seats are up for re-election every two years. And so we started out running together until we found out that there was a new seat that was open because of an account of someone being appointed to another office, something political. So we reached out to Rachel Walls. So Rachel is running for an interim seat. So it's an unexpired two-year term because, again, someone was appointed. Rachel, uh, who's not with us tonight, is an Elkhorn resident. She's an environmental and community activist with a master's degree in environmental studies. So uh, Karen, uh, Rachel's focus is improvement of water quality standards. And um, to get to actually get into out of the gray infrastructure, which is most, most of the digging of ditches, and um, one of the Green Party's stances is that we should focus on green infrastructure. We need to do something with the water other than find a space to store it. So again, Rachel is running for the two-year term. And finally, we have Jeffrey Covich, who is running for a seat that was just vacated because of a death of, I forgot, is it Bradford? Timothy Bradford. Bradford, his seat. So Jeffrey is a Rogers Park resident. He's a for, for, former project oversight analyst for agri agriculture and developmental investments in Afghanistan. 
We focused on transparency, ethics, green infrastructure development, and municipal I don't even know what work, and the municip municipalization of the uh, major projects. And again, uh, Jeffrey will be running to fill a two-year term for a vacancy of Bradford. And so now we are going to go through the problems and solutions as we see it as a Green Party. Go ahead and start us off. All right. I think the first one on there is you. Okay. Um, so uh, climate change readiness. Currently, the problem is that the uh, board does not have a top-level strategic plan to make no mention. They, there's no mention of climate change. We all know. Well, most of us, I guess, that believe that the news is real and not fake, that climate change doesn't exist. So we have an agency that is, um, is, is has to address water, the, the rising flood levels and all this other stuff. Not only does they have you know, the storage issues, but the flood abatement is a major concern for the MWRD. But they have no plans or no policies in place to address it. So the Green Party believes, <coughs> excuse me, that the uh, MWRD needs to write a climate change analysis we need to make sure that it is something that's done strategically, because as flood waters rise, as the polar caps, caps melt, that there will be more water. What are we going to do with it? So again, we cannot keep dig digging ditches and um, doing whatever. So we have to come up with a departmentalized plan to address climate change, and that's our hope. Oh, so Karen, <laughs> Karen's going to do the next problem solution. So get ready. Go ahead. I was trying to get you a glass of water. <laughs> All right, let's discuss chemical pollutant testing and disclosure. Our water quality testing only examines a limited number of pollution metrics. Most specifically, the EPA requires that uh, water and the biosolids are tested for pathogens, germs and viruses, and heavy metals, lead, cadmium, mercury, things like that. Some of the things they're not testing for, pharmaceuticals, Hormones, pesticides, fungicides, little tiny plastic particles. And one of the reasons that this has become such an issue is that the MWRD is actively promoting the use of biosolids in community gardens where children are handling the material, in schools where children could be handling the material, and also in other uses where perhaps uh, it is not as risky. We are asking that the MWRID strengthen testing metrics beyond the EPA mandated minimums. We're asking that they prioritize public reporting and that the MWRD commissioner staff and resources are used for public outreach. Can I go off script here a little bit? Okay. Um, beyond that, we're asking that they use standard, that they fully disclosed to the public when they are releasing the biosolids, when they're making them available. For one thing, how many people here have heard of their sapling giveaway? Heard of that free oak tree? Nobody here? Well, the free oak tree comes in biosolids. And when I asked them about it, they said, well, we don't have to plant your oak tree in biosolids. You can just have the bare root sapling. But of course, when I'm asking that question, I'm not asking just for me. Because I'm not just worried about my exposure, I'm worried about other people's exposure. So this is just one example of how the MWRD has an opportunity to give people information. They'd rather pretend that there are no questions about biosolids. The EPA did a study of biosolids on a nationwide basis. They tested 74 water treatment plants in 2007. They took 84 samples, so some plants were double tested to ensure consistency. Of those 84 samples, every single sample had yeah. residues of triclosan. That's the antibiotic and hand sanitizer. Think about the amount of, and when antibiotics are in the general environment, that encourages antibiotic resistant bacteria to grow. Do we really need that? Okay, I'm off that podium. Who does the next part? Home flooding? We try to switch it up so you don't get bored of looking at any one of us. I was on the radio the other day. They told me I had a great face for radio. So, uh, yeah, road and home flooding. Let's talk about flood issues in Cook County real briefly. Um, 
because I think anybody who was around last week or a week and a half ago when we had those three or four days of heavy rains is aware that the current flood prevention infrastructure is inadequate. Our roads flood, our homes flood. And more critically, when there is flooding that you see on the surface level, what's happening in the waterways are what are called combined sewer outflows, which is just a fancy term for raw sewage getting dumped into your water. Those happen because most of Cook County is old. It was built with what is called a combined sewer infrastructure, which means everything goes into the same pipe. So when you flush the toilet, when an industrial operation discharges industrial waste, and when it rains, those all go into the same pipes. If you get a lot of rain over the same period, of over a short period of time, the pipes hit capacity, and what's coming back up out of them is the combined everything. It's not just the rainwater. So to prevent that from coming up into people's basements, or at least to attempt to prevent it from coming up into people's basements, what the MWRD does is discharges it into the waterways instead. If you've ever been near one of the sanitary canals or one of the branches of the Chicago River shortly after a rainfall and you've noticed the bad smell, that's because they're dumping untreated sewer, uh, untreated sewage into the waterway. And the MWRD would like to pretend that's an uncommon event. They'll tell you, oh, you know, we only open the floodgates and dump it into Lake Michigan once every couple of years. And that is true because they're mostly not dumping it into the lake. They're dumping it into other waterways. Last year, 2017, there were roughly 2,000 combined sewer outflows. So that is 2,000 separate incidences of raw sewage being dumped into the Cook County waterways. This year, we're already up to over 200. There have been over 200 raw sewage dumps. And where these are primarily occurring are gonna be in neighborhoods that are already underserved. It's not gonna be along the North Shore Sanitary Canal. It's not going to be in the nicest neighborhoods. It's going to be down on the old industrial neighborhoods and the lower rent residential neighborhoods on the south and west side, which are already underserved in so many other ways we find it somewhat offensive that we are literally dumping our crap onto these people and saying that that's our waste treatment plan. So, the solution is to build an infrastructure that can actually absorb that rainwater before it goes into the combined sewers and then comes boiling back out with everything in it. One of the easiest ways to do that, one of the most effective ways to do that is to rebuild our green spaces. Pavement does not absorb water. Soil absorbs water, roots absorb water, plants absorb water. Um, to do that on a county-wide scale, to create huge rain-absorbing green spaces, would take buy-in from other government agencies, from the Department of Transportation, and we can work as MWRD candidates to bring those people in, but the MWRD has a unique opportunity to take the lead on this because they are, in addition to everything else, a major landowner. They have almost 10,000 acres of land in Cook County, which is supposed to only be used for flood prevention or wastewater treatment purposes. We're gonna talk a little, in, I think the next slide, what they actually do is rent a lot of that out. So as commissioners on the board, what we would be interested in doing is ending these industrial leases that they're handing out and turning those plots of land that they already own and are mandated to use for flood prevention purposes into usable green spaces, which would serve both a flood abatement purpose and would also be recreational spaces, community gardens, things of that nature, things that bring a civic benefit as well. So that's where we are at on road and home flooding in the MWRD. And there we go. I'll turn it over to Tammy to go into a little deeper into those leases. You want you? Okay. Take it away. All right. Currently, the MWRD rents its taxpayer-owned land to private industry, frequently at sub-market rates. These leases typically run for 39 years at a time. Some of the industrial polluters include, was that an oil company? Yeah, there's oil storage tanks. There's oil antifreeze, storage tanks. Antifreeze See, you should be doing this. All right. Here. Okay. Uh, all right, all right, let me back up. Yeah, uh, can, the, part, of, part of the problem is the scale. There are literally hundreds of these leases, but some of the most egregious things happening on MWRD land are oil storage tanks, some of which have leaked. There are tenants on MWRD land who have been sued by the EPA, the federal EPA, because they are waterway polluters renting on the land that belongs to our water treatment agency. Uh, there's an antifreeze manufacturer, uh, there's an asphalt manufacturer, um, a lot of heavy industry with heavy industrial discharge. Um, and again, they are not always as thoroughly investigated as we would like, but we know the federal EPA has found at least five violators on MWRD land just in the last 10 years or so. So it is really an egregious problem. Um, and these are often sub-market rates. These are often sweetheart deals going to well-connected donors. Um, you know, they give money to the MWRD campaigns. The MWRD gives them a nice tidy lease for not too much money. And everyone benefits except the taxpayers and the citizens. So one of our top priorities as MWRD commissioners would be to simply stop issuing those leases, period, end of story. No more industrial leases. Um, to work with the legal department to see if we can evict any of the tenants who are active polluters who are breaking the terms of their lease by polluting our waterways, and to replace that industrial use with the green spaces I talked about earlier. Okay. 
There you go. Oh, this one is the camera. There we go. Yeah. And um, as we mentioned earlier, the board has been democratically controlled for over 20 years. So one of the things that, that has happened as a result of that, which is what happened, I think, when um, you know Democrats are around for a long period, there's nepotism and patronage. So the problem with the MWRD patronage is that everyone uh, here, I'm like, everyone's here on the phone call. I don't really know what that means. Jeffrey, you may have to explain that part too. But we do know that there are commissioners that are employing their children. They're uh, stacking the uh, payroll with friends and family uh, as, again, political patronage, which then becomes an, an issue for the taxpayers because then we're seeing less returns on the money that's spent, um, that's spent on actually ensuring that you know, they, they uh, focus on climate change or green infrastructure or even an independent council, which is something that we think is needed. So what we would do is implement nep nepotism Prohibition, and not you know, it's not to say that we can't hire our children because you know maybe you do, but you can't hire them on someone else's dime and ensure that they are qualified to do whatever work that they are paid to do. And again, this is where we believe that the use of an independent, uh, fully funded, legally empowered, empowered inspector general would help to ensure that those practices, practices and policies are above board. And finally, there we go. I'll take this one. I'll tell you this one. This one's been in the news lately. Um, if you guys uh, read the Daily Herald, um, I think just today's edition probably, I saw it online this morning, so it should hopefully be in the weekend edition or it'll come out Monday. They just did a report on this based on some data that we actually helped them with. Um, the MWRD commissioners, the nine Democrats who sit there, vote on a lot of issues, but one of the largest and one of the largest expenses is private contracting. A lot of the work the board does is contracted out to private firms. And what we found when we looked at those contracting records was that roughly 60% of that money, so about 60% of the contracts <coughs> that that board issues, that they vote on to approve, goes to their own campaign donors. Um, often quite substantial campaign donors, often people who are giving many thousands of dollars. Uh, over the last five years or so, the board has approved $722 million in contracts to their own donors, to people who donated to the board members who were voting to approve or reject that contract. Um, and it's one of those where the legal standard for pay to play says that unless they hand the suitcase full of money over well saying, I am giving you this with the understanding that you will approve my contract, it's not technically bribery. It is technically legal for them to write those huge campaign checks and then turn right around and bid on contracts. But I think everyone in the room knows that it ain't right. And it's the idea that there is somehow a fair and equitable bidding process when some of the bidders are campaign donors or not is similar to the idea that they do a fair and equitable candidate search for these administrative assistant positions and it just so happens to go to their own children. You know, those are equally realistic premises as far as we are concerned. So what we can do about it as elected Greens if we were on this board is twofold. Uh, number one, we would like to see the board do more of its own work. We would like to slowly reduce the amount of contracting and see the board expand its in-house expertise. You know, their signature project has been Deep Tunnel, the Tunnels and Reservoirs Plan TARP. That's been a more than 40-year project. You could have literally raised your engineers from birth in-house for that project, but instead they've been writing contracts, private contracts, for the last 40 years, and it's been, you know, a multi-billion dollar project at this point. Um, so we would like to municipalize, uh, essentially to assign more of the board's work to the board itself. Um, but more importantly, Green Party candidates do not accept corporate donations. We do not take campaign money from for-profit corporate entities. So we can safely promise that literally every contract that comes in front of us will not be coming from a campaign donor. There is no chance that we will be evaluating contracts that came from someone who gave us money because we will refuse that money. And I think that for voters that should be a very reassuring thing. To hear. Um, so let me talk about the 2018 election real quick, and then uh, we will uh, do some question and answer. Um, the reason 2018 is particularly exciting, this is, as I said, an, as the, uh, we said at the start, a nine-member board um, that has historically been all Democrat. And in a normal election year, every two years, you elect three members to that board. They serve staggered six-year terms. Because of the vacancies that were created in 2016 and 2017, in November 2018, five of the nine seats will be on your ballots. Anyone who's even passable math knows that's a majority. That's a majority in play, and the Green Party is the only opposition party, the only non-Democrat party, that is positioned to have five candidates. 
So the, the Republicans have filed, I think, two candidates, and the Democrats are positioned to file five. So we will be the only option to run the table and take that majority control away from the Democrat machine in Chicago. And that is an exciting electoral opportunity. Those don't come up very often. We are talking about a billion dollar hub in the patronage machine that could overnight fall out of the hands of that machine, and I think that's very exciting. There are some catches there. There are the three six-year terms, and there is a two-year term that was uh, left vacant back in 2016, so the Board of Elections knew about that. They scheduled a normal election for it. We also have the unfinished term of Timothy Bradford, um, which is a two-year vacancy that only came up in December of 2017, right at the end of the normal filing period for candidates. Did you want to cover this one, Karen? You're looking eager. Let's do it. Talk, yes. talk to them about the vacancy of Bradford elections. <laughs> So there's no opportunity to get Jeffrey Covich on the ballot, this is Jeffrey Covich right here, except for him to get written in. We wish, it, can I just ask quickly, how many people here are registered voters in the city of Chicago? Well, guess what? You can't write Jeffrey in because the Chicago Board of Elections has refused to print a Green Party ballot for the primary. You can't write him in. Go move to the suburbs. Suburban voters will have the chance to write Jeffrey Cubbage in. And don't spell his name like cabbage or cribbage. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. But he needs 1,720 write-in votes to be on the ballot in November. So we're asking people who are suburban voters to write him in. That means you go to your local polling place, you ask for a Green Party ballot, they look at you like you're crazy, and they say there's only Democrats and Republicans in the world. You say not anymore, because the Green Party's here, right? And some of us, I first ran for this office in 2010. No. I didn't. I ran in 2012. I lost count. 2012, 14, 16. This is my fourth time running. It is not fun being a third party candidate. But a third party cannot grow if people are not willing to push and run when nobody's heard of you. And I think as Jeffrey has said, we have this great opportunity to take the board. Is it possible? Yes, is it probable? No, but we're still going to ask for your vote. Please vote for us in November. I'm very much hoping that Jeffrey makes it on and there will be five of us. We'd like you to vote for all five of us. What comes next, Jeffrey? Let me grab it real quick. Okay, Jeffrey's going to speak quick. It'll be the get involved pitch, but okay. I, do, I do want to clarify on that Bradford election, that write-in situation is true across all the parties. Um, so because the candidate died at the end of the filing period, normally the governor would just appoint a replacement but uh, Democrats in Cook County are not fond of letting Republican appointees take even one seat on their board. Oh, that's right. So they came up with this tortured legal theory that said instead we can have that election on the November ballot, but there will be a right in only primary on every party's ballot. So if you pull a Democrat primary ballot or a Republican party ballot or a Green Party ballot, you will see a separate line that is Metropolitan Water Reclamation District Commissioner, unfinished two-year term, vacancy of Bradford, and the only option there will be a write-in. Um, and the Democrats have some registered write-in candidates. I am a registered write-in candidate for the Green Party, and the Republicans did not register one, so theoretically they have no way of accessing that fifth seat in November. They're already locked out by, uh, by the way the County Clerk's Office decided to run this election. So it is a very, very unique situation, um, but there is a minimum number of votes. It doesn't matter if people write you in unless you hit that minimum threshold, and for the Green Party, the number is 1,720 votes. We are established in all of Cook County. Uh, the City of Chicago Board of Election Commissioners has refused to print our ballots on legal grounds that are very shaky. We have uh, joined a lawsuit against them. However, the odds that that will be resolved by March 20th are very, very slim. All they have to do is drag their feet and run the clock out. And we may well win that lawsuit, but the result will just be to set precedent for some future year should this weird situation ever come up again. So our hope is still that the City of Chicago voters will be able to do that right in, but we can't promise you that. Um, however, the Cook County Clerk's Office has confirmed they are printing Green Party ballots for all of the suburban Cook County. So that's where we're at on the vacancy right now. Um, if this is exciting to you, if this is an opportunity you would like to be a part of, 
There are a couple of ways to do that. Uh, number one, we canvas. We go door to door. Um, Canada's go door to door. We talk to people about this, and we target our canvases specifically along the waterways. We are talking to people who live in the areas most affected by the decisions of the MWRD. We have had some great conversations on the doors. People are upset about the way their homes are being treated, about the way their city and streets are being treated. So when we go knock on those doors, we have a real good time. If you would like to join us on that, we are doing that the next couple Sundays. Tomorrow we'll be down in Crestwood. Uh, the Sunday after that, March 10th, we'll be down in, uh, just south of the Brookfield Zoo. We'll be uh, just below the Brookfield Zoo. You can find those on our website, uh, mwrd-ilgp.org. We've got flyers at the back. Just make sure you grab one on the way out. There is an events page there. It'll be listed. If knocking on doors isn't your thing, but you would like to make some phone calls, we are still uh, doing some double touches, reaching out and making sure we've had a couple of conversations with our Green Party members, and we always need more people to work the phones on that. These are pretty easy conversations. You're not asking anyone for money and you're only asking Green Party members to vote for a Green Party candidate. So it's usually a pretty friendly conversation. So if you'd like to do that, even if you've never phone banked for a political campaign before, we'll train you up. We've got the materials. Uh, we'll get you started making those calls for us. And again, you can sign up to do that on our website. There is a volunteer tab that you'll see right at the top. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, uh, we do not take corporate contributions. The only contributions we accept are from individuals. Um, and we've even, over the years, various Greens have refused a few of those because the individual worked for uh, an industry that they did not approve of. So we are very, very selective about who we take our money for, and that means we are always broke. Um, some of our Democrat opponents are out there fundraising fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars for this election. You know, spending by the time we get to November, they will have spent more than a hundred thousand dollars on a sewer board election, which is insane. We have, on a good month, $1,000 in the bank. So if you want to help us out with that, please do. We will spend it wisely. It only goes to canvassing materials um, and necessary supplies. We do not pay political consultants. We do not run political ads on TV or anything like that. So your money will be well spent. And the very last ask is, of course, if you live in suburban Cook County, or uh, if we get lucky and we are able to have ballots in Chicago as well, uh, please vote for us. Uh, you will need to ask for a Green Party ballot to do it. A write-in on another party's ballot does not count. So ask for a Green Party ballot. Do the write-in on March 20th or at any of the early voting locations. And I think with that covered, we're ready to go to Q&A. Is that right? Yeah, yes. Yes. Um, All right. I'm going to turn right. off the projectors now. You. Could you hit the... Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Let me move this and then maybe we can all just kind of squeeze in and share the mic. Okay. Get cozy, we're all comrades. Oh. Yeah, we're going to turn off. I'll get it. I apologize. Their comrades must be socialists. I apologize. I forgot. One last thing. If any of those volunteer opportunities interest you, we are going to send around a stack of cards where you can just sign up to do it. Just give us your information, check off the different roles you're interested in. Uh, and leave it on that table or hand it to one of the candidates before you take off. We will get in touch with you and get you plugged in. So I'm going to send these around the room. Okay. We just uh, no. get no. those started. Send the stack around. Take one and pass it on. Okay. okay. That, that's great. All right. The first question I want to ask you guys. I want to know the status of what the deep tunnel project is. And it was supposed to take care of all of the flooding and, and flood control problems, you guys still just just go ahead and take that. Uh, oh, gotcha! Great. Uh, and and uh, with, can you give me an update on the status of the deep tunnel project? And is it true that Stickney, Illinois, is the largest sewage treatment plant in the world? Not anymore. And really? just just let us know. Yeah. Okay. Let me do the uh, deep tunnel, and you can be sticky. How's that? All right. Uh, so the status of deep tunnel is behind schedule and over budget, uh, which should not surprise anyone who's been around Cook County for a while. It, uh, this project started in the mid '70s, so it's been around for about 40 years now. It's cost us upwards of I think three billion. No one knows for certain because so many different phases of it have been filed under so many different accounting methods. No one has a, a dollar amount of how much we spent on deep tunnel. But the big uh, sort of signature of the project was a set of three reservoirs that would store stormwater and other runoff when it was too much for the uh, for the tunnels to hold. Two of those reservoirs are fully online. The third one, the largest the Cook Reservoir, they brought partially online in I think December, just recently, uh, they brought partially online. So we're two and a third of the way there, uh, basically. Actually, Tammy and I both toured the Cook, and we saw a waterfall in the side of the... Yes reservoir and one of the, the engineer who was doing the tour said we have a waterfall and I said 
well, why is the waterfall there? And she explained how the entire interior of the reservoir had been sealed against leaks. And explained the process, but there had been a leak. And I said, well, are you guys going to fix it? And she said, no, because the company that did the work doesn't need to fix it. And I said, you mean they didn't guarantee their work? They paid for work? That, yes, I have no more words for this. you have any more comments on that? Okay, um, before we go on to your next question, okay, I want to show you guys something. Hang on, Jeff. Sure. Okay. We're kicking it old school here. Here we go. Okay. So this is uh, rainfall for the past 90 years. This is rainfall for the past 90 years. You do not need a degree in math to see that rainfall is steadily increasing. Anything engineered 40 years ago is not going to necessarily work 40 years from now, right? And that's why we're asking for a complete reboot, a complete rethink. Thank you, that's it. Yeah, the uh, average rainfall yearly has increased uh, by about nine inches over the last 90 years. So you know, you can do the you can do the math on that. It's about an inch every decade. What's that? There was a build more reservoirs or what? Green infrastructure. We need to start creating more absorbent surfaces. We need to create ways for rainwater to go back into the ground and not. If everything is cement. What does cement cost? Cement costs a huge amount of money, right? You're in Chicago, you see Walsh construction trucks out there. I'll bring it back. Walsh used to be a Chicago company, they're not a Chicago company anymore, right? This is a big opportunity. I see great infrastructure as pouring my money down the same hole we've been pouring that money down for 40 years. I believe green infrastructure, which is absorbent surfaces, places for water to go, maybe artificially created wetlands that become natural. This is what we're asking the board to do, the MWRD to do on their 9,000 acres of land. Stop leasing it to polluters. Start using it for green purposes. And what was your other question, Tim? You asked another question. I want to know why is Stickney still the largest sewage treatment plant in the world? And if it's not, where what is? It's the largest sewage treatment plant of its type in the world. That's, it just moved from first to second, and I don't know what's first. In China somewhere. It's, it, Jeffrey says it's in China somewhere. So that's recently that it's no longer the largest. And then how, how can a guy like me take a tour? They have tours all the time, and one of our audience members is about to. Yeah. Go ahead, Julie. Well, if, if you want, we can arrange a tour. So if you're interested in going and spending a day at the sewage treatment plant, watch all the mm, flow around. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> actually, it's a really fascinating tour. I was very impressed when we went the first time. Um, there's a lot that's done there. There's a lot that has to be done, but it's still not enough. And uh, you also get to see where the composted sewage is being stored, or creating compost. And um, uh, so it's kind of, again, as you heard, questionable that that's even safe to, you know, to put certainly in our parks, in our gardens, in our golf courses. So it's really good to see. And they, they'll put you in a bus and take you from the main facility down to where the composting happens. And probably you'll be able to see the quarries. That maybe they'll do that now, since that seems to be a new part of all this. But if you want to do it, let us know, and we'll arrange it. Is there a cost involved? No. Maybe offer a bucket of popcorn. Yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, there is a lot of cool stuff at the MWRD. It is fascinating and vital civic infrastructure. Like, I realize when we start talking about campaign donations and pay-to-play and cronyism, it's very easy to get very negative. But I do want people to think about this as an incredibly valuable taxpayer-funded resource. We need good sewage treatment. We need good flood abatement. And there are some engineers doing some cool stuff, but they are being incredibly badly served by the current leadership. In the back there, we got some questions. Yes, I'm sorry. You're a math professor, you said? Uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey gave me a promotion. I'm technically a limited term lecturer at Purdue University Calumet. Okay, by the way, the bottom line, uh, 350,000 is greater than 35,000. Would you agree? Yes. Okay, so if we could increase the Green Party um, uh, membership by a hundred fold by November, not only would that be a good thing, you guys might actually win. So, we would love to win. So if we could do that, um, would you and the other 
um, members um, support a, a, a simple way of doing that, and I can explain. I'm a scientist as well as a physician. I have an extraordinarily simple equation, much simpler than the okay. The bottom line is it provides clean, renewable energy, and it saves three to tri uh, three to five trillion with a T annually. Okay. Nobody has to take my word on anything. I will share it with Jill Stein. All right, let's wait. If, if Jill Stein, if Jill Stein, the this question is, is that if you could actually win party of uh, elections by having something such as a true way to have truly green power, not just in Chicago or Illinois, but around the world. Can you and I talk about this after we do some more audience questions so that. that we focus the on the question, The question is, would you guys be supportive of my reaching out to Jill Stein to do precisely that? Of course. Yes. Good. Yeah. That's it. That we had another question there. Yes. Um, I'm wondering uh, what it would take to have the list of uh, uh, chemicals of interest include radioisotopes that are uh, the, that are dumped into Lake Michigan from uh, from several power plants on the lake and several well I don't think the power plants in uh, in Illinois uh, that that get their cooling water from rivers. That water would go down to the Mississippi, but uh, the the Zion plant and Kiwani uh, and the plants across uh, Big Rock Point, Palisades, Cook, they all leak, and um, the the radioisotope should be included in uh, in uh, chemicals of interest. And I'm wondering what it would take to get that sort of a interest going in the uh, water okay. regulation. Well, if, if, we, if Greens are elected to the board, if we are elected, we're going to do our best to be responsive. Now, I think what you're saying is you're worried about the water in Lake Michigan. And the MWRD doesn't do a lot of testing in Lake Michigan. They're separate from the Department of, from Chicago's Water Department. The MWRD is going to be doing more testing in the rivers. So yeah. that would be where we would have to focus. But your question brings up a bigger question, and that has come up because I hear people ask me questions about, what about my water bill? And I have to say, well, your water bill has nothing to do with the MWRD, but in a way, we should be thinking about water as a resource. Yeah. And I'm going to share a little basic math with you right now. Most of you are City of Chicago residents, and if you pay your water bill, you know that your sewer bill and your water bill are now equal, right? It comes to about a third of a cent per gallon. A third of a cent for getting the water in, a third of a cent for getting the water out. That's your sewer bill. If not you, Julie, because you're in Oak Park. But if you're a city of Chicago resident, that's what, that is what you're paying. But that's not the only way you pay for water. Because after your water leaves the city sewers, it goes into the district sewers. And you pay for the MWRD water treatment in your tax bill. And that comes to about another third of a cent per gallon. So think about where we are right now. One third of a cent is to get the water. We're paying twice as much to get rid of something as we are to get it. And I think on the planet, we're at that stage in our human development where we have to really understand there is no place such as a way. So ultimately, and I know this is my last campaign, Ultimately, I'm going to be pushing for some sort of comprehensive way to address water. We live in one of the areas of the world that is blessed with beautiful, safe, mostly safe, clean, fresh water. It's a treasure. It's not being treated as a treasure. We all need to treasure it, and I'm going to pass the mic on to someone else. I do want to, uh, because we do get asked about water bills quite regularly, I do want to underscore a uh, few things. First, yeah, the, the water that comes out of your tap is managed by a separate agency. It is managed by the City of Chicago's Water Board or by a different agency in a suburban municipality. That said, a lot of the rate hikes in a lot of our suburbs are coming from privatization. They are coming from a couple of companies that come in, buy out the municipal utility, and turn it into a private commodity. In Illinois, the biggest defender is the Illinois American Water Company. 
Bills and Mamolio, which is a French company. Uh, they're most famous for doing the testing in Flint, Michigan, and saying that the water was okay to drink about a year before the, uh, the lead poisoning became a national news. Um, and I mentioned those uh, not because there's that much we can do on the board, but because several of the current Democrats on the boards do take donations from those companies. Um, and have there have been contracts given to private water firms in the past. So even though it is not directly associated, the firms that are in the business of buying up municipal water and turning it into a privatized good are deeply invested in maintaining some sort of influence over the board. Um, and as long as we keep electing people who take their money, they will have that influence. So as with everything, follow the money. Um, other questions from the audience? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I realize this has relatively little to do with the reclamation, water reclamation district. But what is the Green Party's reaction to what's going on in Cape Town? They're about to run out of water altogether. Sure. So, again, as you say, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District doesn't have too much influence over anything beyond its mandate, much less globally, but I think it, 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 it's part of a larger picture of growing scarcity that we need to be very, very real about. And here in Chicago, like Karen said, we're blessed with abundant resources, which means we're, where people are going to be coming as water becomes more scarce, we are going to see increased demand. As I mean, Cape Town is one example, but even here in the United States, there are places that are becoming uninhabitable either because they're running out of water or because they're going to be underwater soon. And Chicago is relatively safe from both of those. So if our water board, if our wastewater management plan is not anticipating those changes, we are going to run into real trouble sooner rather than later. Right now, Cook County is losing population at a fairly small rate, but we are losing population. The idea that that's going to stay consistent and that we can count on that and bank on it in our water management plan for the next hundred years, I think would be deeply, deeply foolish. Yeah, let's go back there. Or was, was no, I just want to say something about that. To Cape Town? Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't remember when, maybe a decade or so ago, and Karen probably remembers, but there was an effort by, there was an effort by uh, the states in the West to run pipes from Lake Michigan and the Great Lakes to the West. Now, that's going to happen again. You know the dr terrible drought they're having. Well, they're having a terrible drought for a lot of climate reasons that, you know, fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera. So unless we can really make those changes, which the Green Party fully supports the change, is working as hard as they can in the states where, you know, this is going on. But they will try to run another pipe. You watch, the, in fact, the, the word did come up recently. Oh, you know, you got water there, we can use it here. So uh, just keep that in mind, you know, when preserving, the, saving the water here and then making the changes we need all over the country. Go ahead, I think he's gonna do the battery. Let's get your question, I'll just talk loud. Okay. Um, How's the Foster Tunnel coming? What is that going to be online? I don't know the answer to when that's going to be online, and I don't think the current commissioners have made any public statement on that either. Um, it's like a lot of things with Deep Tunnel, it is very, very hard to get information on exactly where a specific part of things is. Um, Karen, you got something on that? Go for it. Well, um, I know that when they do open it up, they'll, take, they'll do a lot of public tours. And if there's anything like the McCook tour that Tammy and I and Julie did, you will get a little blue net bag filled with rocks. The bag was made in China. I'm sorry. Yes, I, I know. I love it. <laughs> uh, do we have another question? I have another question. Okay. Uh, what about all these carp? Can yeah. somebody use those? <laughs> they were brought here for food, supposedly. Yeah. Uh, I think Jeffrey's going to answer the question and give you our position. Okay. <laughs> that was the Asian carp? Is, yes, did I hear that? Yeah. 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 So the Asian carp, um, for those who don't know, it's an invasive species that was introduced into American waterways and is making its way steadily closer to the Great Lakes. Um, and there's not really any debate on the science of it. If they get into the Great Lakes, they are going to wipe out what little remains of the native species. Um, it will be devastating to the to an ecosystem that has already been ravaged, ravaged, ravaged excuse me, by invasives. Um, there are a number of initiatives underway in the rivers to try and curb the Asian carp. Um, it's, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers has presented, I think, three plans on it, with one as their most recommended. And most of the other states in the Great Lakes Compact are on board with one or more of the Army Corps of Engineers plans and would like to move forward. Illinois has been historically dragging its feet. Our state has been very reluctant to buy in because we are worried about it slowing down the speed of shipping that moves on the Chicago River. 
um, and we're worried about the cost. We don't want to spend our money on it. Um, so the MWRD has relatively limited ability to help beyond the, the boundaries of its uh, waterways, which end at the Lockport uh, station. But within that, the MWRD could theoretically be cooperating with Army Corps of Engineers, especially again because they own most of the land along the waterways. They would have the ability to act unilaterally. They would not need a buy-in from the state government or from city or county governments to do at least some of the carp prevention uh, initiatives that the Army Corps of Engineers would like to do and is currently unable to do. Yeah, all the way in the back there. Well, I got a two-part question. Uh, who is, what are the entities that are testing our waterways for solutions? And are, are you guys doing it? Well, we are not currently. Yeah, so we're who, not are, elected, who, yes. who are the other entities? One, and then two, I was intrigued with this lady's comment then that we test for certain things, but then we don't test for certain things. Can you point those two things out too? So that's a two-part thing. Sure. Um, so the answer to the agency that does that is responsible for the testing is the MWRD. The, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District has a, I want to say it's called like monitoring and reporting uh, branch or something. One of their departments is specifically dedicated to water testing and water quality reporting. In Lake Michigan? No. In, all no. in the waterways. In the, in the Chicago area waterway system, which starts at the inlets from Lake Michigan and ends at Lockport. So they do all of the pollution testing within that system. And does uh, Illinois EPA and the Federal EPA they, yeah, they are. They have they have testing and monitoring departments that are totally separate from the MWRD. Um, so the MWRD does publicly report its numbers in theory. What they've done for the last couple of years is they have just reported the raw data. So that will be a massive Excel spreadsheet with every individual sampling location, the dates they were sampled, and all of these various chemicals. There has not been a public report since 2016. So for the last two years, if you just want a summary of what's going on in your water, you're out of luck. You've got to be someone who's got a, a decent... red flags. You've got to be someone who's uh, got a decent analytical background and the time and patience to work with, you know, these many hundred thousand cell spreadsheets to figure out what the heck's going on in the water right now. Um, and then I want to let Karen speak to the other half. Uh, can you, what was the, the second part of the, part of the question again? So what are the EPA Oh yeah, the, ke the chemicals, the EPA tests, yeah. testing for now, yeah, and um, what are we ignoring that is killing us? Yeah, okay, so <laughs> I can talk about when EPA tested the biosolids, right? That test was a nationwide test that was done in 2007 and the report came in 2009. And they looked at things that are regulated, such as lead, candy, and mercury. They looked at pathogens, and they also looked at a long list of multisyllabic names of things you've never heard of that are probably bad for you, but the EPA has not set standards for. Okay? And that's what goes back, goes back into the waterways. Right well, that's in the biosolids, which is what's left after the water has been released back into the waterways. What do they do with the solids, the sludge? So right now it's being composted and basically it's being pimped out to us as a soil amendment and as a fertilizer. It is very fertile. I knew a community gardener in my community, Southeast Chicago, and he took 80 cubic yards, that's two big truckloads, and he had beautiful growth for four weeks. How about the water that's going back? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> then he had a massive nutrient collapse and all his plants just laid down and died. <laughs> because everything, the, it was so rich in nitrogen that everything grew like crazy and then there was nothing left. It was it's not really soil. So you're asking me a question I don't know the answer to and I'm ducking it because I don't know what the EPA is doing right now. Okay. Yes. Yes. But I would really encourage everybody here, go on the EPA website, look up biosolids, <laughs> And then if you have a printer at home, make a copy because they closed the climates part of the EPA, okay? They're gonna close everything. You think they're not? You think they're not gonna close things down? And there isn't gonna be a value in having things in print? Well, no, we never said that. Yes, you did. I have your 42 page report here because I ran it off. So think about that. You may not want to go out and ask people to vote green. You may not be that type of person. You may be like me where I'm not an active, enthusiastic campaigner, but I love getting data and I love saving it because I have a feeling that at some point we won't know these things if we trust our government to keep the records. I'm sorry. I, 
I did. I didn't do a great job on your question, right. but go to the EPA website. I can have briefly do it. Uh, one, one thing I would add. Oh, there we go. In, uh, one of the one reason we do want to be a little cautious when we say oh, at least the MWRD is testing for EPA. They test for everything the EPA does. Uh, you know, they're meeting some sort of minimum standard, and that's great. I do want us to keep in mind the EPA and what they think is mandatory sort of comes and goes with the whim of the president. So, you know, every time you get a new administration, you get new efforts to change those standards. So if all we're doing is towing the EPA line. That's going to look very different in a Trump administration than it did, uh, you know, just a couple of years ago. So that is one of many reasons to have our own in-house, much stronger standards that go above and beyond the EPA. And I can tell you, uh, if you go to the um, MWRD, they have a general, uh, they have a maps portal, a GIS portal. One of the things that does get reported there is water quality testing, and it's only a handful of things they report. It's uh, dissolved oxygen levels. They do fish counts. They do um, fecal coliform, you know, the bacteria that's found in human waste. Um, they do phosphorus, and I think there's one other that's on there. So you, you, yeah, you can find the map and see that they're testing for those things. But then when you go to the data tables that they don't put in those top line reports, there's actually quite a bit more in there that doesn't get onto the mapping system. So you got to dig pretty deep to get any kind of detailed picture. And that's something we'd like to check. That's, we see the educational role of the MWRD is deeply underserved right now. Yeah. I, I was just on the website for the MWRD. It's a hard one to navigate. Like, what do you guys do to upgrade that? Yeah, it, it is uh, sort of the greatest hits of the early 2000s web design in a lot of ways. Um, and they they basically mean, again, the, the sort of uh, Freedom of Information Act minimum on public disclosure right now. They will hide whatever they can in terms of contracting information, spending information, budget information, things like that. Um, so that's a relatively easy fix. Um, you know, it requires spending money on your web design and making sure more data gets up there in more accessible forms. Each of the individual departments of the MWRD, they have 10, as we said, does submit thousands of reports, I mean, huge amounts of data. That data rarely gets turned into any kind of public summary. So that is something that each individual department could be tasked with. They could be set, you could, the board of commissioners of the MWRD could very easily say each department head is responsible for, you know, a top line summary for public consumption every single year. That is mandatory. If you're not doing that, you're not meeting your mission. They have not said that yet. Um, Green certainly could. I would be interested in seeing that happen. I would like that website to be more useful. Um, and I don't say that just because I'm campaigning against the incumbents and I've been taking a lot of data from their website to do that. Um, we had a question all the way in the back. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> regarding the uh, Chicago Board of Elections choice yeah. to not provide a Green Party write-in ballot, um, do you know the official reason that they gave for that decision? Well, this is long. The official reason they gave for that decision, what legal actions did you have or took, and what your thoughts on uh, why they actually did it? Yes. Like anything to do with elections in Cook County, it gets arcane. Um, and frustrating very quickly, so bear with me here. There are two issues in play. Number one is that the Green Party in Cook County does not have a ballot listed contested primary. We have four candidates for the MWD and there are four <coughs> slots for the MWRD that have candidates listed. So there was no contested primary. Uh, Illinois law says that if there is not a contested primary or a write-in candidate who files their write-in candidacy with the election authority with whom petition signatures for that office are filed, then they don't have to hold a primary. In this case, I am a registered write-in candidate who filed with the Cook County Clerk, which is the election authority with whom those petitions are filed. So I do not think they have a legal leg to stand on there, but as I said earlier, all they have to do is drag the court proceedings out until after March 20th, and it won't have any practical effect, even if we, as I suspect, win any lawsuits associated with that. The other wrinkle, um, and this one affected some of the Democratic writing candidates as well, is there's a separate section of the law which says to be a registered write-in candidate who is recognized by the local election authority, you must file your write-in candidacy with the relevant election authority or authorities. And on the basis of that or authorities, the uh, City of Chicago Board of Elections has said that because they are a separate election authority, even though they are entirely contained within Cook County, and even though the Cook County Clerk's Office is the election authority that runs MWRD races, MWRD write-in candidates who did not file separately with them don't have to be counted. Um, and there are, there's a joint lawsuit that um, some of the Democrat candidates are on as well regarding that. Uh, and the uh, circuit court upheld the Board of Elections decision on that, so that's something that will either have, uh, and I believe an appellate judge as well, so that's something that will either get appealed further up the chain, um, 
or just st sit as it is. But so those are the various ways in which they are finding, uh, the various ways they are finding to make sure people can't actually be written in. I, I will be probably in the unique position this year of being a registered candidate who cannot vote for himself. Uh, <laughs> so good times in Cook County, never don't love it. All the way in the back, yeah. Yeah, if we elect Greens, aren't you going to want all kinds of regulations? that I meant factories are going to have to close and we're, we're going to lose jobs? The jobs argument. What? Yeah, so how many jobs do we think there are in private industry on MWRD land right now? Anyone want to take a guess? Probably about 10,000, maybe about 1,500 or something. Not, yeah, yeah or, or less. It's, it's less than the board employs. Um, the idea that it is the responsibility of the MWRD to provide jobs through the mechanism of not getting in the way of people who want to do industrial pollution is frankly a little <laughs> absurd to me. Uh, that is a very arcane way to generate jobs. The MWRD is an employer. They employ close to 2,000 people, and as I said earlier, I would like to see them employ more. I would like to see them doing more in-house because it is a better way to retain talent, to retain institutional knowledge, um, and to attract people with degrees in things like engineering and the sciences to Chicago to come here and live here and be taxpayers. Um, so, <laughs> the notion that the MWRD is going to come online, uh, the Greens are going to come on the MWRD board and suddenly legislate uh, industry out of existence, I think it would, we'd be hard pressed to do that even if we wanted to, but realistically, <laughs> most of the regulations that the MWRD has the power to write itself apply to new developments. They are things like restrictions on how much paved surface you have, they mandate a certain amount of water set aside, they mandate a certain amount of green space, things like that. And those are all grandfathered in existing properties, can be what existing properties are. The MWRD does not have much power to change that, except possibly to evict some of its leaseholders if they're violating the terms of their lease. But by and large, the only regulations they can change or pass are to new development in Cook County. Um, and some of those changes, I think, would be very beneficial. We have a lot of flood-prone properties in Cook County that are down on the floodplains. They're turning into a major insurance expense. They're putting a lot of people out of homes that they moved into relatively recently. There is a, a need for more serious flood-related regulation than we currently have in Cook County. So I think Greens on the board pushing for those regulations would be a service to the county and to the taxpayer. Can I just, again, add to that? Sure. I just came from a conference of the Chicago Community Gardeners Association. Uh, there are 1,500 people involved in that organization. Uh, the, uh, there are a minimum of 400 community gardens in the city and several urban farms. With all the land that the MWRD has, we could be growing our own food here, not growing it in California with our own water. So there are jobs possible that are not industrial, that use fossil fuels and create damage to the world. We could be replacing and amending the soil and growing food here. It's possible. So, you know, you have to think kind of down the way. Uh, frankly, I'd like all the factories to shut down and the jobs to become green jobs, the way Karen referred to uh, green systems. Yeah. Vertical farms? Yeah. yeah. And vertical farms, indoor farms. Yeah, right? indoor farms. Right. Yeah. Other questions? We have other questions here? Um, yes. Yeah. Assuming that all five of you get elected, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. what, uh, and you have your problems and you have your solutions. Do you have the auto uh, autonomous authority to implement those solutions? Or is there a, an executive or uh, like, like the, the county commissioners or, or, or the governor that's going to make the final decision? Um, I'm thinking of the CEO, Ray LeCare. Yeah, and he, for the he NRA. Could, LeCare, right? Sorry. Yeah, he he could easily tell us that something we want to do is not possible. Right. He, he, he will report to us, but then he can say, well, we, we can't do this, or this may not be practical. So right. he would be in the role of bringing us down to earth and making sure we stick with what's possible. <laughs> but he is a technical person, and I think if there is a sensible new direction, that he will respond to that. Oh, is this the guy that's making a million dollars a year in salary? I don't think it's that much. Maybe. Yeah. I'm not sure. I saw something online when I was when I was looking into this. Oh, then I need to bug him more because he's supposed to answer one of my emails and he hasn't answered it yet. I'll, so, I'll put him to work. Well, let me ask a second question. Okay. Why aren't you involved in replacing him? 
He's not elected. Oh, he's not elected. He, he, he serves at the pleasure. He is appointed by the board. The executive yes. is appointed by the board. The highest authority is the board of commissioners. Okay, so you're you would have, you would get rid of him once you're on the board. Not right no, away. no, I, I would not say that. I, I, we are not running on a platform of kicking him out of his job. He's actually the first uh, executive of the board or executive of the di uh, district to not come out of the district in like 50 years or something like that. He's the first outsider that they've hired to that administrative post in a very, very long time. Um, and I think he brought some, some good ideas with him and some good expertise with him. Um, yeah, so, no, but the, to answer the question of decision-making authority, it is the, the Board of Commissioners of the MWRD is that nine-member body. And nominally, it's a democratic body, right? In, in the lower D, cap, lowercase, cap, uh, uh, lowercase D sense of the word, the reason we have nine of them is they are supposed to debate and vote yeah. and disagree with one another right. that by and large okay. has fallen by the wayside they vote in agreement on nearly everything they've approved every single contract that's come in front of them for more than five years um, they've never said no to giving money to private contractors um, I, within the last five years it's something like 99.6 percent of the measures put before the board were passed so uh, i think i would argue that they are not serving a terribly legislative function at this point Karen, go ahead so the board meets every other Thursday, or virtually every other Thursday, if you have the exact schedule, uh, on their website at 100 East Ohio, is that right? Erie. It's on 100 Erie. East Erie. Just off the state. Usually 10 or 10.30 in the morning. If you're curious about what they're doing, go to the meeting. You have to sign in. You need ID. They'll try to give you the skinny packet for the agenda, take the fat packet, and see where your money's going. Watch George Blakemore in action. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's this older man who manages to go to the Park District meetings, to the Board of Education meetings, to the CTA meetings, to the MWRD board meetings, and he just keeps asking questions. I wish there were 20 of him, because without people who are actively talking about what's going on, you know, I hear the little joke about, ha-ha, you guys are not going to win this time, right? Yeah, Maybe we're not going to win this win. time. You can't win. Anyone you here want to run in 2020? <laughs> yeah. There you go. I'm looking at you, sir, because you look like you're under the age of 60. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. you are. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, look, I'm 64, so I'm getting ready to figure out <clears throat> Medicare. I get lots of phone calls all the time. Oh, we want to talk to you about your Medicare. Are you from the government? Click. Like, why am I suddenly a valuable commodity? It's a little bit scary, right? All of a sudden, I have something. I have something I don't control, right? My medical budget, but somebody else wants that. But it is hard work being a candidate. It's, a hard, it's hard work being a third party candidate. And I want to compliment Jeffrey. I want to compliment Tammy. This is her first race uh, for being willing to take this step. And we are always actively not just seeking new members but also people who are willing to run for office who do have to be um, a little bit outside the box to be willing to do it. And you, ma'am? <laughs> and you, a uh, question? Yeah, um, speaking of that, uh, there wasn't much talk about other Green Party candidates. Who's running for governor? For We're not running a gubernatorial yes, candidate to not? my knowledge, no. I'm going to tell you that this is our best race. Okay? Yeah. We, yeah. We've That's received more votes than Joe Stein in Illinois. We received more votes than any other green category because people get the idea, people who normally don't think of themselves as environmentalists, they get the idea that it might be smart to have people who are worried about the environment in charge of what Frank Avila calls the pee and the poo. <laughs> that's what I don't want to throw our other Green Party candidates under the bus here. We are going to be running, uh, there's at least one candidate for State House up in the 64th District, but that's outside of Cook County, that's uh, up, up in Lake County. Um, and we have Randy for Congress down in the 12th Congressional District, who's running a very good campaign down there against a uh, particularly unpleasant Republican incumbent. And I will say, one of the reasons that you see Greens running for the MWRD and for the 12th Congressional specifically is that those are districts where we are an established party. And that means we get to play by the same rules as the Democrats and Republicans. If you're not an established party, which is a hard threshold to meet in the first place, it is very, very, very hard to compete in Illinois. For folks that don't know, the difficulty just in getting your name on the ballot if you are not a Democrat or a Republican starts at about 10 times the effort in terms of number of signatures 
and it can go up to about 60 times the number of signatures. So by the time you get to the voting booth, if you see a green on your ballot, or a libertarian, or constitution party, or an independent, or whatever else, those people did a lot more work, spent a lot more volunteer hours getting to that same ballot line as their opponents did. So if it seems like they didn't run as spirited a campaign, if they didn't run as many ads, there's reasons for that. Um, it is a very, very difficult system if you're an outsider. So we are fortunate that the hard work of folks like Karen and some of our earlier candidates established us in the MWRD against very long odds so that we are capable of running this kind of serious campaign in 2018 when this five seat opportunity came up. In uh, the beginning slides, it said that uh, the MWRD owned 13,000 acres in Fulton County. Yes. Do you know where Fulton County is and uh -huh. why we have that much land there? Yes, uh, Fulton County is uh, just south of Peoria uh, is, is where you'll find Fulton County. Um, and they own a very large chunk of land there for uh, testing purposes. Among other things, they do experiments with the biosolids. They also have some, uh, they're, they're reaching out to some local farmers to do partnerships on irrigation and flood prevention and water management and all kinds of things to do with farm agriculture. So it's basically their research station down there. Um, and the reason that acreage is so large is because they are doing some farm-related experiments, some agriculture-related experiments, so they need substantial acreages to see how these sorts of things will scale up. So that's the answer to that. Yeah, Tom. Water, reclaiming water would be a concern if we didn't have much of it. But according to your presentation, we're getting more rainfall than ever in the history of this, the city geologically and we've, we're getting storms where we can't control 1985 storms that there's overflow so is it really important what this agency does Yes, uh, I, yes. I, would, I will just say yes, start that off. Um, you know, reclamation is valuable because water is a limited resource, even here in water-rich Chicago, but it is also crucially important because you are, the water that you reclaim has been filtered of all the things you don't want in your water. So this agency here, this is not the drinking water agency, that is the water board here in Chicago, but the water that they're drawing on will be clean or dirty based on the work that gets done at this agency. Um, and I do, I do think the idea that, well, we've got like Michigan and storms are getting stronger, we're fine, we don't need to worry about it, would be an extremely short-sighted perspective to take. The rainfall is mostly going into the sewers and becoming immediately mixed with contaminants before we ever get a chance to use it, unless it goes through the reclamation process and we get some of it back that way. So, you know, unless we're going to make some serious infrastructure investments in rain collection that goes to the water board, which would be a whole different infrastructure project with a whole different agency in charge of it. We desperately need the MWRD and the work they do to be good, reliable work. We have had uh, represent members of the district here at the college, and they were advocating rain barrels. But why would you advocate rain barrels if we've got more water than you need? Karen, go ahead. Okay, the purpose of advocating the rain barrels is to keep water out of the sewers during a rain yeah. event. Yeah. It's to hold back some of that water. Everybody here needs water. Do you want water two feet deep in your bedroom? Do you want six inches of water in your basement? No. You want water to come out of your faucet. You want water to water your lawn, etc. right? And you want that water to be reasonably clean. Now, I've had rain barrels for years. Who here has a rain barrel, by the way? Anyone? Okay. Would you recommend them to another person? Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. Uh, should we talk about what you have to do with a rain barrel in the winter when it fills up with water and it starts to freeze solid? No. You know? Okay. You empty it in the fall is what you do. Yeah. Right. You wash your car with it. You wash your car with it. So, so you don't have to pay for water from your faucet if you use rainwater. So that's one thing. And it goes to the aquifer, which it doesn't do now because there's so much concrete that the rain goes into the sewer. It doesn't go into the groundwater. Yeah, I love my rain barrel. Well, I don't I have a car. Do. 
Charles, do you have a, a tree that you could water? I should have a turtle. Charles, do you have a tree that you that you could water? Uh, a tree that you could water? Right. And actually, I did use rainwater one year. It was October, and of course, one of the things about rain barrels is when your rain barrel is full, it just rained, and so your garden doesn't necessarily need water. And I had too much water, so I decided to run it through my washing machine. Oh. And my water bill for two months was $11. Right. So that was a lot of work to save $11. I worked out my per hour compensation. It was about 50 cents an hour. But now I can tell you that there are ways to use the water that falls on your land. Fortunately, in Chicago, they're not illegal. Uh, I'm, I'm, Charles, I'm stuck on your question. What are you saying? Are you saying because we have so much water, we shouldn't worry about what we put in it? <laughs> well, it, it, it seems like just basically, since we're not in it, it it's not that big an issue. Um, I'm not certain. Do you have a, a house that floods? <laughs> Is that what you? Is that That's what part the of the issue. Is? Yeah. All That's right. part of the issue is that if water isn't handled well, <clears throat> sewage is going to mix with rainwater and it's going to end up in your house or it's going to end up in Lake Michigan. And you're going to have to do who, who who gets floods? Let me just see. We wanted to have a short poll the audience time, so I don't know if this is a good time. It's, if someone has a question, please pop out with all it. Right. I just, well, now's a good follow. time, but I'd like to get to uh, rebuttals. So. Okay. So, just out of curiosity, I know most people here are City of Chicago <laughs> residents. How many people here are registered Green Party members? Can you Thank you. How many people here think they might vote Green in the, in November? Wow. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Good question. And how of the different issues we raised up, I'm just going to mention three so we can get to the rebuttal section. Biosolids and toxics, who thinks that's important? Corruption. Corruption. <laughs> and what's the last one? Oh, flooding. Flooding. Yes. Flood abatement. Okay, well, thank you for being a great audience, and I think we're moving forward to rebuttals. All right, Andy. What's the process? Well, let Andy explain it. You guys sit down and listen. <laughs> You sit down and listen, okay, and then we have a hand uh, again, and we'll go to rebuttals. All right. Save your time. Yeah, we'll have a show of hands. Uh, who wants to give a rebuttal, and we'll take a head count. All right. Hold your hands up and keep them up, please. So only six people want to give a rebuttal tonight. We'll go, we'll Everybody go. gets a half an hour. Yeah. Well, we'll, go, thank you. we'll go four minutes each. <laughs> no, we'll, we'll go with our usual four minutes each and see, because uh, yeah. there's going to be more people who will have a thought if they, yeah, see, they get underway here. So who's going to be first up I'll here? go. I'll go first. All right. Hey, Thank you. Can we get names on each other's bottles? Just have everyone give a name at the start of it. Thank you. All right. Radioactive water. Yeah, what about, what about My name is Tim, and I want to let everybody know that uh, I'm not exactly, you know, everybody says let's change the current government. Let's get the throw the incumbents out. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, we just had an election like that down in McHenry County. One guy who had no experience in government. He had, he did not hold a job, was taking over a certain township presidency because the guy had his two sons and his wife and himself employed at the agency. The thing was they uh, did a lot with their budget. There was virtually no corruption. It was a pretty much open agency. And uh, there wasn't a lot of, a lot of trouble with, with the agency. The roads got paid. They had senior <coughs> programs come in. And this guy just came out and he said, we got to change the, this guy's running a family dynasty. we got to make a change. Well, since he's come on board, the first thing he wanted to do was fire four people, which was basically the entire staff of, the, of that township government. He has spent over $255,000 in legal fees to make sure 
that he was defending himself against the unions and the other people, and including some people who want to throw this guy out of office now because he's done such a horrible job of uh, administration of the of the of the department, and they haven't paved a single road or done any and done really anything since the election. And it just seems like everything that, 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 that everything that this new boss has done is just fight legally to preserve his power and get rid of the family members who are legitimate employees of the agency. Uh, that to me, you know, and I want to make this very clear, Rauner came in on the same platform. Let's go shake up Springfield. Let's do this stuff. Whatever happened to good governance, good order running the government, whatever happened to that old-fashioned value of you know, we're going to spend the taxpayers' money wisely. <coughs> yeah, there's always been a little bit of corruption. Yes, there's always been some things, but, you know, sometimes it just takes guys like myself, maybe some guys like you running for these offices, that might help in getting rid of stuff. Because I can tell you, you know, it's not always the party in power that's the worst thing that can happen. Sometimes it's those guys who get in, claim they're going to want to make all these changes, and then, of course, absolutely bankrupt the thing. We've seen this with Rauner in the state of Illinois. We're seeing this now a little bit more with our President Trump. He's in and he's got ideas that are 40 years old on how to run our country, and he's basically not doing the job. Now, I don't know about too much about the Reclamation District, but they seem to have a plan in place for a long time. These guys just want to seem to basically open up and, and clean up the agency a little bit, not you know, and address things like climate change. That I can support. But if you're going to go in and say, let's shut down the tunnel, let's do this because of some radical views, then I couldn't support you. Uh, I support good governance, but again, balance and figure out what's going to happen. Because sometimes the, income, the person who's going to come in and make change will be your worst person around. Thank you. What about, what about the What? What about Fukushima water? Charlie, we'll, de we'll deal with <laughs> Fukushima and uh, the other waste issues later on when, if I can get a full-fledged <laughs> nuclear power and thorium involved. But that's a story for another day. There's actually more radioactive stuff that comes out of a coal plant than any nuclear would. And fracking. Yep, fracking. Yep. Thanks, Tim. Uh, my name is Doug Binkley. Um, as many of you know, uh, uh, I've been active in politics uh, on and off uh, for many years. Uh, uh, I worked uh, for a party called the Citizens Party, which was a uh, uh, precursor to the Green Party in this country. Uh, it was an environmental party, a party for social justice, uh, amongst other things. Uh, it, one of the radical views was uh, uh, government control of the, uh, of the oil companies. Uh, and uh, um, we uh, ran a presidential candidate uh, named Barry Commoner in 1980. Um, Jimmy Carter was looked at as a weak uh, link or something. And, uh, and um, uh, unfortunately, um, Reagan won. Um, now, the Citizens Party was not really a big part of that because we only got a quarter of a percent of the vote. We might have got more if there hadn't been a maverick uh, uh, Republican, progressive Republican, or liberal Republican, uh, John Anderson ran, and he got something like five or six percent of the vote. And, and so, and Reagan won by what was, what is viewed as a landslide in this country anyway. Um, but uh, I've always regretted that. I've had a bad feeling about that. Uh, third parties, um, don't usually succeed in this country. Well, actually, the only one that did was the Republican Party <laughs> with Fremont and Lincoln. Um, they did succeed, but they really took over the Whig Party is what happened, and, uh, and they uh, got the uh, anti-slavery uh, vote in with the Whig Party, and that's how they succeeded. It was a, a one-time occurrence. Uh, the two major parties, however, you, it is unjust that they have this stranglehold on the system. Uh, third party is only likely to succeed if laws are changed so that ranked choice voting, or as it's sometimes called, instant runoff voting is allowed. Uh, this enables, this would have enabled um, Gore to win against, uh, against George W. Bush, that, that horrible person, uh, and 
people at the time, and, and this goes back to 1980, which uh, um, a lot of us succumbed to the view that there wasn't any difference in the two major parties. And, and we, the Citizens Party, we're guilty of that. I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone else of uh, per perpetuating this myth that uh, there's no difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. Now, we have to admit that, that there's, the lie has been given to that with the fact that the Republicans have become so incredibly toxic, so incredibly evil. Uh, they're a party of treason, basically. They're the party of collusion with Russia. They're the party of, um, they don't care what it takes to win. And uh, also, they're just completely in the pocket of the corporatists, uh, the Koch brothers, and all of the, the vile elements of our capitalists, uh, our unbridled capitalism that we have today. So the problem with having a third party uh, is that if you split the vote amongst the, uh, you know, the sane people against the insane people, and if you split the sane vote, um, or you know, in Monty Python it's the sensible party, uh, if you split the, the sensible vote, um, you can get, you know, the, uh, the crazy, crazy party can win. Anyway, um, I, my heart goes out to the Green Party people here tonight, and they did their homework, they had a very good presentation, they knew a lot of answers to a lot of the questions, um, they're very reasonable people, and I'm glad to hear that they're not running a, a gubernatorial candidate because it will split the vote against Rauner. Um, because unfortunately, if you look at the Democratic candidates in that primary, and by the way, uh, if you get a Green Party ballot in the primary, you can't vote in the Democratic Party primary. This is part of the stranglehold that the two major parties have, and, and that is unjust, absolutely it's unjust. And we're stuck with that situation. So if you have a preference in the Democratic um, uh, gubernatorial ballot, you're going to have to vote in that uh, Democratic primary. But uh, if you want to vote for these Green Party candidates in the general election, that's fine. But never, ever, until we get the situation solved about ranked choice voting, run a Green Party candidate for president like Jill Stein, OK? That was part of the ruination of our country. And you're so we're stealing on, on our other now. parents' time. So I'm done. A friend of mine came over my house about two months ago, and he brought some uh, filtered water that he got from the supermarket. And then he says, uh, take a glass of regular water which I did, and he had like a, it looked like a thermometer. And he put it in the regular water, and it was all full of dirt. What you're drinking now is full of all that junk, but you would never know it. Then he took the uh, thing and put it in the filtered water. It stayed like it was. So we know that the water we drink, if we actually seen that little thing in there and it turned that color, you wouldn't drink it at all. So it's not very clean, actually. Uh, as far as parties are concerned, I think uh, it's not a good idea for a very small party to run for president or vice president or those higher offices. I think it's better for them to get into the smaller offices, like he's on the, with this water reclamation district type of thing, so they could build up their image. But I remember in 1948, I don't look that age, but I am, 1948, I went to Wrigley Field and um, heard our Vice President, uh, Henry Wallace, make a speech and he made a speech under what they called the Progressive Party at that time. And I think he got about a million and a half votes or something like that. And there was a lot of effort put forth with him doing that. And then, of course, you had Jill Stein, and you had, uh, what I forget his name, Nader run for office, and they got very few votes. So I don't think it's a real good idea to run for these higher offices. I think it's a waste of time at this juncture in history. But if you could get 
people in the Green Party in the smaller places, like in the Board of Education, you get people to run for different things and things of that nature. And you build up the image after a while when, when the uh, depression comes, and I see a depression coming because of the wealth is all on the top, a few percent on the, all the half of the world's economy. And a depression is going to come, there's no doubt about it. When it comes, I don't know if it's this year or the next year, nobody can make a prediction on something like that. But that's when these parties, these small parties, Socialist Party, the Communist Party, the Green Party, <coughs> so forth and so on, will have a chance to get in. But they have to build their way in slowly. Yeah, that's what I do. I agree with you. Uh, uh, Charles uh, asked a question which I thought was actually a very good question. Can I get a name? Pardon? Name for uh, your name. For oh, uh, David. Um, uh, the question was if we have such an over, uh, a, almost a problem with too much water, how come we're worried about conserving water? And that was kind of touched on by uh, a person in the audience and also uh, the speakers. But I wanted to talk about that some more. Um, we, we, we are incredibly, I think we just basically take it for granted. We have this beautiful lake, we've driven by it, we've, been it, we've voted on it. We live next to one of the largest fresh water, the supplies of fresh water. In the world. In the world. Now there are some other lakes that have huge supplies, but they're like in the Canadian Arctic or in uh, the Russian Arctic to actually have this massive amount of fresh water with the five Great Lakes. And uh, the Lake Michigan is actually a much bigger system because it's connected to Lake Huron. So it's really a huge amount of fresh water. And we take that all for granted. Um, so uh, we don't really understand uh, or we take it for granted we have all this water and but there are other people who see this it, it's an incredibly valuable resource there are actually people who are looking long term and investing in fresh water sources or creating water out of water uh, out, out of salt water because fresh water is getting very valuable in a overly populated world um, if uh, oil companies are willing to build 2,000 mile pipelines to ship oil, you can bet your, you can bet a dollar that somebody's thinking about how to make money by selling water. If you look to the west, about 500 miles, it's the Great Plains, a huge system for farming. It runs from Canada all the way down to uh, parts of Arkansas and Oklahoma, and underneath is something called the Oglala Aquafiller. Yeah. All that fresh water where it rains out there gets stored underwater. It's a massive amount of fresh water. And the problem right now is that the farms and the commercial farmers are overusing it. Every year, the water level in that aquifer gets lower and lower and lower. It's an immediate problem with the small farmers who can't afford to drill deeper wells long term, the big problem is they're trying to figure out when are they going to run out of this water. And they're thinking in about 40 or 50 years. And you know where they're going to start sending the straws when that water runs low. So this wonderful resource we have is under threat long term because the, uh, the politicians and industry are not properly managing the aquifer out in the western states in the farmlands. Huge, big problem. It's not going to affect us, but it'll affect our kids and our grandkids and our great grandkids. And, uh, and global warming is just going to add to the problem of the reduced water uh, aquifer. So that's what I want to pass on. Thanks. Thanks very much. Well, this isn't about water, but it's about a hot what? topic. Guns. So we have these uh, young high schoolers that are going to be going to Washington a little bit, and they will have a, a voice. 
the ones that aren't dead, the little ones that were killed off, they don't talk. <clears throat> but these ones are going to talk. And regardless of what Mr. Trump does, he's going back and preaching dumping all over the place. Uh, regardless, things are going to happen anyway. Um, how many of you have cars? How many of you have keys to the cars? Okay, that's good. <clears throat> this is just an idea. It doesn't exist right now. But why isn't there a code for each gun that is produced? If you don't have a code, you don't use the gun. And if you had a code uh, that could be given to law enforcement people to scramble the code, the gun won't work. You're not confiscating the gun. It just won't work. It's just an idea. Anyway, there are things that happen. Even if it doesn't happen on the national level, it's going to happen on many state levels. And the, the, uh, this gun problem is going to take a long time, but eventually, after a few more mass shootings, I think we'll eventually get it. We'll get it done. Yeah. All right. So this is this is your weekly trashing of Wall Street again, right? I'll try to work Wall Street. Yeah, take a bath. That's pretty it. nice. That works well. Well. Well, yeah. Wall Street's anti uh, environment, of course. Who do you know about war? Start your brief it's, cost, it's a cost to have clean uh, products and air and water. Wall Street doesn't like to pay that. All right, so um, uh, nice to see green people. And, you know, um, we got a lot of uh, politicians coming up here. Uh, Congress, a couple others. We've had a couple others. You know, it'd be nice if you folks... Um, would point out where, you know, since there's so much money in politics, it'd be nice, I think you did point out some somebody, that, you know, who, who's funding who, and how much, and and I know there's dark money out there. I don't know if in the water reclamation area, but uh, it'd be nice to know, to follow the money and point out who's funding, you know, your competitors or other politicians and really hammer that home with the public. You know, some creepy company or, you know, it's like, you know, some big polluter is funding some schmo. You know, it'd be nice if every, all these politicians pointed out who was, uh, who was funding, uh, you know, who, who, was, who was running for stuff. So, um, that was one point I wanted to make and then uh, I forgot the other point. <laughs> Old. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get up there. First of all, with regard to the Ogallala Aquifer, the the um, amount that I've heard that they've got left is 20 years, not 40. So they may be running out of water sooner than anybody thinks. And several farmers, several of the leading farmers down in Kansas and elsewhere have said that my grandchildren are not going to be able to pursue farming as a way of life as I have. Um, with regard to the idea that um, they can steal the water from the Great Lakes, well, yes and no. On the one hand, we are limited by international treaty with Canada, uh, which among other things keeps people from selling water from the Great Lakes, including that goes for all, all, the, all the states in the compact and also the, the Canadian province, the provinces in Ontario and Quebec. However, the other side of this coin is that some years ago, Dick Armey, remember him? The congressman from Texas who was the House Majority Leader for a long, long time. Well, Armey went up, up to uh, some place in Michigan where he was <coughs> helping a Republican congressman get elected. And he looked at Lake Michigan and he said uh, the following, I'm from Texas and down there we know that whiskey's for drinking and that water's for fighting over. You people need to guard your Great Lakes because when we come up here we're not going to buy it, we're going to steal it. Right. I agree. And I think that should be posted on a bulletin board in every home, yeah. every business, 
every school, every office, uh, both governmental and non-governmental, in all of the Great Lakes states and in, and in uh, Canada. Thank you. What should it say? Dr. Kim Ladian, I am a scientist as well as a physician. I was saying before, I have an extremely simple equation, much simpler than E equals MC squared, can provide clean, renewable energy, and it saves two to three trillion with a T annually. Nobody has to take my word on anything. I will share the equation with Jill Sign, and I'll come back to why Jill Sign. Um, by the way, I've offered it to everybody from uh, Bernie to, uh, to Trump and Hillary and JB and Rauner, so it's not like I'm picking on Jill, but my point is anybody who can get the job done, I'm for. I'm a scientist, not a politician. I believe in truth, not ideologies. And the whole point is to solve problems. By the way, if you took the water that's melting in the Arctic and you filled the aquifer, it would be done with the problem. If you took some of the clean renewable energy from what I call the Global Energy Independence Program, or GEOP, you could provide uh, through desalinization plants, not just Texas, but in the Middle East, and turn deserts into gardens anywhere in the world. So for five minutes of Jill's time, if I can't convince her in five minutes, we're done. But if I can convince her, and she does a teleconference with Jeff and everybody else before, and I emphasize the word before the November election, she does it before the primary, Jeff might actually have enough folks to win, but which would be nice. But the others are already guaranteed a spot on the, the boat so that by November we could get at least four people uh, elected. And the idea is to go from 35,000 Green Party members around the state to 350 thousand by November and the way you do that is something called leadership but it also involves something called grassroots democracy which in theory is is uh, plank number one in the ten plank platform so you know grassroots democracy would include things like um, uh, e-voting and e-conferencing why should it only be the people in this room why can't we just have that same video go to everybody across the state across the world for that matter who wants to watch it it will good but you know but promote it you know as that and the same with voting why should it be a, a few people in a room on a certain day why not have e-voting throughout the state um, and you can do it online you can do it by phone you can do it in person but that's true grassroots democracy third thing is a form an e-form I've given um, Jeff multiple times the material for months and months on uh, the proposals you know for the uh, global energy independence program and by the way that's my scientist hat as a physician I have something called safe haven which is like the old CCC or WPA where uh, if you provide jobs for people prevention oriented jobs particularly uh, after school programs daycare centers if you have if every child in Chicago was in an after school program and everybody coming out on probation and parole had a job, you would cut crime and murders 50% next year, period, end of story, and you could have a gang-free, drug-free, full employment economy by 2020. You wouldn't know about that because the material that I would be delighted to send you is being censored by Jeff, which that's not good democracy in my mind, that's more fascism. But the point is, that democracy, a true de grassroots democracy, is based on dialogue. Ben Franklin knew that. He wrote, he published, he was even the first, you know, the first uh, postmaster general. So by having a dialogue, we could truly come up with solutions. You guys haven't won anything, and you said for 20 years the reclamation has been in the Democrats' hand. How about winning? How about winning? So if you go from 35,000 to 350,000, if we have Jill Stein, on the 24th or the 25th, right at the time before the election, on the 27th, and she says, you don't have to, you can be a Republican, you can be a Democrat, you can be a Martian, whatever, but to the extent right. that you vote for uh, your, the your independence. Up. All right, anybody have any questions? No. Later. No. You can come back on your own. It's your guy's choice, but uh, that's the yeah. choice. Okay. We're ready? We're ready, Andy.
We're ready, Charles. Ready, Charlie? Yeah, maybe we'll get the doc back here on his own. Uh, doc, I hope you refer to Tony. Oh, yeah. All right, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll follow you. Okay, let's see. I'm going to be eclectic as usual here. Let's begin by thanking our candidates and our speakers uh, for being uh, good environmentalists. Uh, good citizens and good greens. Uh, let's see. I just wanted to advertise for the college. Uh, we're going to have two upcoming eco programs. Uh, uh, we always traditionally have a special Earth Day speaker. Uh, Dennis Nelson will is assiduously working on making a presentation this year. And then in June, we've. Uh, we booked uh, the Great Lakes uh, organization uh, out of the University of Illinois. Uh, so they'll be coming here in June and we hope to see you again. Also, if you're interested in ecotopics, there's uh, postcards back there. And I encourage you to affiliate with the Chicago Greens or one of the other chapters the state organization, if you wish. Uh, we have, I think, a pretty good Facebook page. Chicago Greens is kind of interesting. It's an awful lot of hits, as well as a, 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 a traditional website. So I recommend you pick up one of these, take it home, and the first thing you do is log in and say, wow, that's pretty cool stuff, man. But anyhow, uh, I'm a little bit familiar with the topic of water. I've been picking on Tim because he likes nuclear reactors, and I guess Fukushima is discharging about 100,000 gallons per day of radioactive water, like if you drink it, it would make you glow in the dark. And he I told says, you how to no solve the problem, deal. Charlie. You know, uh, but anyhow, uh, it's also a, a topic this this kind of roundabout way, but I'm, I'm a bit of a railroad historian, and one of the important aspects of railroads, at least in the past, a lot of people don't think about this, was they operated on the water. They needed water. Steam engines can't go very far, surprisingly, very not even 100 miles without getting another supply of water. It was a, very much of a concern uh, in the railroads out west often not given much uh, news, but uh, it is a concern even today uh, in operating some tourist railroads out west. Uh, there's concerns about the amount of water that they use. Uh, and a lot of people don't realize that tenders, the tender behind a steam engine, is nothing but a big, a big container of water, mostly water. Uh, which they had to keep filled up. Um, actually, the other thing that brought to mind, it was only when I graduated college and started bumming around the states that I became going out west that how much I had taken water for granted. When I saw how, the situation out west and in the north uh, um, places, out west, northwest, where water was very scarce, I remember was staying with someone who only could water their lawn once a week that could flood it or something. I, it was most peculiar to me. I didn't realize such a rationing existed. The other thing I've been putting out for a couple of years, and I'm still working on it from time to time, we didn't have much this year, but I, I usually put a press release out about why is the snow dirty? Uh, why is it dirty? How is it, is it dirtier than it used to be? But uh, we've had some things on that and some studies on how, uh, measuring the, how snow is dirty. The other thing you guys hit on at a very popular topic, popular topic, a topic of concern is uh, plastics and the minuscule distribution of plastic. Well, the, that island of plastics that's floating around the Pacific, uh, also the bit of this microplastics that we're ingesting in our water. If you're interested, there's a Facebook page called Great Lakes Voter. The other thing, I think you're minimalizing the thing 
with global change, there's going to be two things coming. There's my understanding, being part of the climate reality, reality project, uh, is that the climate change is going to result in either a drought or in flooding. So it's going to be a disruptive effect in, in, in both regards. And I don't think we can minimize that. Uh, it's going to be a serious situation. Uh, and it's going to disrupt the climate in a multitude of ways. Um, if you follow Congress at all, the representatives of both persuasions are concerned about this coastal flooding. This is a real genuine issue. Uh, California just came off the drought situation, went on for five or ten years. Water is a serious issue in terms of Congress. We got time, Andy. Come on, it's 8.15. You're doing uh, a good job. Four people are going to Yeah, we got half an hour. Charlie, let's say. All we're, right. we're still I'll go. From the other speakers. Wait a minute. The one day we get to talk, there's nobody here. Nobody Lots here. of we rebuttal. Got, we got four people. Okay. We got hey, four. Have to give them them more time go. I'm thank you. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you very much then. Thank you. Thank you. No, he's not rushing us. We just don't like the uh, hypocritical attitude. That's all. We went over six minutes, Charlie. <laughs> anyway, just like that sensor in this game. All right. right. Uh, a couple of things that weren't mentioned. Uh, number one, um, Gandhi said, an idea whose time has come, well, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, then they fight you, and then you win. Green Party candidates could get elected all over this country if people simply voted for them. But we are inundated with a mass of corporate bullshit raining down on us 24-7 about uh, don't divide the two parties or the, the crazy one will win. What you need to be talking about when, when uh, we need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that Last year, the media made it. Uh, 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 the media made a deal with Hillary Clinton. They said, "We will bury Bernie Sanders from you. Uh, we'll report him as losing when he's actually winning. If you do good things for us after you get control of the White House." And so then, after Bernie was gone, then the media went after Hillary, and a lot of people still talk about the media says, "Well, uh, the people elected Trump, but it was a slim margin." No. Trump was not elected. Trump lost the election, and three blue states had their votes red-shifted after we went to bed. That uh, Greg Palast is the number one expert in the world on vote theft, and as long as we have electronic voting machines counting the votes, those machines have one reason for being and one reason only. That's to shift votes when you try to vote criminals out of office. We vote them out, and then they just change the vote totals after we went to bed. That's one of the number one issues of is vote theft in this country. You need to go back to paper ballots. Our speakers tonight talking about water quality are absolutely all on the money. All you need to know is one fact. There are some very rich people that know where the next gold rush is. The Bush family, before he left in 2007, the Bush crime family bought 98,000 acres of land in Paraguay. Really? Well, that 98,000 acres sits over the last largest freshwater aquifer in the world. They know the next gold rush is coming in its water. Wow. Interesting. Albert Einstein was famous uh, for a lot of things, but his quote was, the human race is in a race between education and extinction. I'm not sure which side is winning. Extinction. Well, there's three. Uh, I have cards if anybody wants one. We, my brother and I carry cards with a group of portal websites on them. A portal website is a portal or a doorway into the other world where all the blacked out news is. So the media is running coordinated blackouts. I mentioned two of those subjects tonight, the hopes of 9-11 and the hopes of the AIDS epidemic. Both of those are hundred billion dollar, a trillion dollar uh, monsters that uh, many people have died. A lot of people here are old enough to know uh, they were told uh, they had a loved one or a friend or somebody that died of AIDS. Well, the overwhelming majority of people died of AIDS were being poisoned by the AIDS doctors. 
We were told he died of AIDS, but they were dying of chemical poisoning, taking a fatal chemotherapy drug four times a day that just stopped throwing cells all over the body. And that, that was, it's, it's the largest medical crime in history on that one. I'm a volunteer coach uh, for Science Olympiad. This is my 24 year of coaching seventh graders at a middle school out in Arlington Heights. And we teach seventh graders in order to solve any problem, you have to first correctly identify the problem. And then you have to correctly identify the solution. If you go about you know, pretending there's no problem, well, how are you going to find any solutions? You know, it's in Professor Griffin. In his 12 books on, on the forensic evidence of 9-11, yeah. Professor Griffin said, you don't need a 30, you don't need an open mind to understand this. You need a 30% open mind, 30% open mind, and a seventh grade education. The problem is you have to step through the psychological barrier and look at the evidence. It's what we call the Catholic Church Syndrome. People wouldn't yeah. step through the barrier and look at the evidence of the pedophile priest. Half the congregation would say, oh, you're slandering the man. I don't want to hear anything. I'm not going to look at it. The problem gets worse and worse and worse until people step through the barrier and look at the evidence and say, oh, that's easy okay. to understand. And once, once you learn that your priest has been abusing the kids, that's a game changer. You don't, you, once you learn something like that, you don't go back. So that's my point. Uh, those of you, uh, the best news site, the last thing I'll say is the best news site that I know of doesn't take any corporate donations, no, no advertising on the site. It's a thing called Common Dreams. Before he died, uh, Bill Moyer said that was his favorite site for the last 20 years. It posts the best of the best progressive, green, beneficial news of good, you know, like all the people that were here tonight are talking about a green movement on all fronts. Well, those articles, people doing stuff all over the country, show up on Common Dreams every day. And there's other websites, too, on different issues. If anybody wants a card, uh, raise your hand okay. and I'll pass them out. Uh, all right, Andy, let's okay. get our speakers up. So our, our speakers get the last word. Oh, yeah. You go ahead and cool. rebut. We got... Uh, uh, do I need to do a separate, or should we... That's up to you. We've got uh, about uh, 20 minutes. Go ahead and... Uh, base. Well, he's just diving right in, so let's let her go for it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, away, Karen. let's talk about spoiler. How, right. are we, how long do we have? Actually, it's 8.22. we got to be up by 8.45. Okay. You know, take take you got a little time to give your final viewpoints. Okay, I'm just going to hit on a couple of things. Kim, we are not proposing to shut down deep, deep tunnel. Okay, we are not proposing to shut down anything that is working. Okay. We are proposing good government, and we are just proposing a shift in priorities, not a complete makeover. All right. Now, the other thing I heard about spoiler is the Green Party, a spoiler party. Maybe Ralph Nader stole the election away from Gore in 2000, or maybe Bush stole it for himself, and I could go either way. I don't think this is the spoiler election. You're not being asked to block a horrible Republican candidate. The horrible Republican candidates are not going to win anyway. There's only two of them. Some of them are nice guys, and I'm going to say I've met Deborah Shore. She's a very nice lady. She has privately told me that she agrees that the MWRD needs an independent inspector general. And with that, oh, I am also going to say one thing about Fukushima because um, I take vac I take vacations on the West Coast. And we've done radiation sampling on the beaches. We've tested seaweed, we've tested driftwood. And what we were able to see about four or five years ago was levels in the seaweed and the driftwood about double background. That is not horrendously horrible, but it was yeah. something we were able to see that there is an elevation. Yep. And this was in Oregon, which is thousands of miles from Fukushima. And with that, Jeffrey, you've been taking a lot of notes. You're ready, Tammy? Yeah, uh, one uh, last comment on cleanliness of water. Please install a water filter in your home. If you're worried about what you're drinking, don't buy water in plastic bottles if you can avoid it. Water filters are going down in price. We just did it for my dad's house. We just did it for my house. And it's uh, the water tastes noticeably better. We haven't had it tested yet. And I'm going to turn it over to 
one of the two of you. And thank you very much again for having us. Uh, so I'm uh, a big believer in change. I um, joined the Green Party because uh, I don't believe that the Democratic Party has served uh, uh, working class folks well in uh, the state of Illinois, and especially uh, black folks and brown folks. So uh, change, I think, is needed. Because if we believe that, we can um, hope for people to represent your interests by you know, continuing to elect folks that have served and overserved and not made any changes, I think that's not a good idea. So that's why um, I decided to run. So the uh, water reclamation, I, uh, you know, it's, it's an office, I think, that has environmental issues that are, are prevalent. Those, you know, on a daily basis, there's a, a need for some sort of environmental awareness. So that's why, you know, I decided to run for that office. But again, politically, we can't expect, uh, you know, folks that don't have your best interest at heart to, to represent you well. So I think, you know, that's why, you know, if someone is prepared to run, that has the, the will to run, that has the heart to run, yes. that believes in uh, some level of accountability, I think we need to support them. Yes. Yes. All right. All right. All right. All right. Thanks very much. Let uh, me get a time check. What do we got left? We got hours. Well, we got, it's about, it's about 826. Supposedly you have 20 minutes. Try to keep it about yeah. 10 or so. 10, 10 or so. Let, I can keep it under 10, no problem. Okay. Um, all right, let me go through. I'll try and hit on people's rebuttals point by point. I am going to stick pretty much to things to do with the MWRD and the Green right. Party, some of the ones that were completely unrelated. I don't feel like I'm necessarily the right person to be talking on, but um, let me just go ahead and start right at the top of the order with Tim. Um, sure. this, this idea of experience in government, you know, don't vote the bums out because the bums know what they're doing kind of thing. <laughs> that is a good argument if you are happy with the status quo. Expertise in government is relevant if you like what that expertise is doing right now. So if you are content with how Cook County is governed, if you think that one party rule by the Democrat party results in good governance in Cook Party, there is an argument for keeping that party unilaterally in power. The potholes you get fixed. Don't necessarily yeah. think, <laughs> I was going to say, where do you live? Yeah. <laughs> um, Our coming here, we hit about 20 If you think the status quo is satisfactory, then yeah, the people who are currently enforcing the status quo have the experience to keep it that way. <laughs> I think a lot of folks, when you talk about flooding, when you talk about the smells in the canal, and particularly when you talk about just the deeply entrenched corruption and the sheer amount of taxpayer dollars flowing out the door to campaign donors and Democrats, mm -hmm. I think that's something a lot of Cook County taxpayers are not satisfied with. I think there are a lot of people who think that is not a good way to be spending millions and millions and millions of dollars of our money. I, I am someone who struggles once the number gets north of a million to like just comprehend what that is. So when we say 722 million over the last five years back to the campaign donors, that's three quarters of a billion, like with a B. That is an enormous yes. amount of taxpayer dollars going directly to campaign donors. And that's just the top level, like we compared the firms that are contractors with the MWRD to the firms that are listed as campaign donors. That's before you start looking at subcontractors. That's before yeah. you start looking at the owners of those firms making personal donations. That's before you start looking at firms which donate to the Democratic Party of Cook County, which then uh, donates to the individual campaign right. committees of the people running for the MWRD. So that $400,000 or so that they've taken from um, people who contract with the MWRD is really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and I think that regardless of where you stand on the water issues, regardless of where you stand on anything else, yeah. that sheer level of waste and corruption is something that is not worth keeping in office. That is something we desperately need to vote out. And every single one of the people on that board take those donations. There is not uh, a member left on that board. Timothy Bradford, the man who died in December, was actually the only one who had not taken campaign contributions from MWRD contractors. So with his death, there is no one left on that board who has not taken money from someone they've then approved millions of dollars in contracts for. Um, so I think the, the idea that that is the expertise we should be keeping in office is not an idea I would agree with. Um, so uh, the spoiler argument, I'm not going to dive into the presidential things. I will disagree on some of the Jill Stein stuff. My job here is not to defend Jill Stein. I worked on her media team, so I did. it was my job for a while to defend Jill Stein, but happily that is no longer something I'm responsible for. I will say that it doesn't seem terribly relevant in this election because there are five open seats and the Green Party is the only opposition party running five people for it. Um, if anything, the Republicans are in danger of spoiling it for us. Um, I think that as the party that got its act together and got five candidates lined up for five seats, they need to get out of our way. Um, and we're running against, you know, a bunch of deeply entrenched incumbents and we're sort of the only 
strong opposition voice there. There's nothing to spoil there. You should be voting for Greens. Um, this point, like I said, I'm not going to argue about Jill Stein. Let's just leave it. That, that is not my job anymore. Um, let's see. Let me just keep going down the primary ballot. Oh, yeah. So the, the one thing that um, did get brought up, and this was Doug who mentioned it, was the issue of the primary ballot. You do have to choose a Green Party primary ballot, at least in suburban Cook County, if you want to write in me. Um, that goes into an uh, issue that I am fond of talking about, which is Illinois is not a partisan registration state. The State Board of Elections does not maintain a record that says you are a registered Democrat, you are a registered Republican, you are a registered Green. The only official record of your partisan affiliation is the primary ballot you choose every year. And you get to choose every year. Every time there's a primary, you go in and you say, I want the Democrat ballot, I want the Republican ballot. If it's available, you can say, I want the Green ballot, I want the Libertarian ballot, whatever. So that's the only way our electoral system records your partisan support. That's how the Democrat Party knows roughly how many supporters they've got. That's how the Republican Party knows roughly how many supporters they've got. So when you pull a Democrat or a Republican ballot, because there's a race you care about, probably at the top of the ticket, maybe it's something more local, but there is a race you want to influence, you get to vote that. You also will probably have somewhere around a dozen other races on that ballot, many of which will be unopposed, which you are inherently lending your support to by pulling that ballot. You are casting a vote of confidence in the party, at the very least, and many of those parties' candidates are unopposed. In Illinois, in a given election year, uh, State House, anywhere from one-third to one-half of the races are unopposed. There's only one candidate on the ballot in November, and in the primaries, it's often the same or even worse. We actually have municipal elections where we literally can't find candidates to fill the seats in some of the power counties. Um, so what I say to people is when you have the opportunity to pull the Green Party ballot, or alternatively statewide there's an opportunity to pull a nonpartisan ballot which only has the referendum uh, questions, those are options you should consider if you are dissatisfied with the candidates on the Democrat ballot or on the Republican ballot. If you think literally none of these guys is good enough for you, make that known in a positive and active way. Don't stay home, go to the polls, pull the Green Party ballot if you're available, or pull the nonpartisan ballot to cast a recorded vote of non-confidence in the Democrats and in the Republicans. It is something people can do. It's not something many people do. Most people stay home in a primary election in a non-presidential year. Last time around, Chicago's turnout was like 16%. You know, hardly anyone turned out. So you're very, very, very lucky to crack 50% statewide in a primary. So most people are already checked out of the system. And what we would like to do is see them show up at the polls and support third parties, or if there is literally no third party to support, Take the nonpartisan ballot as a way of casting a vote that says the system is broken, I am refusing to participate in it, and I want you to know that. I want there to be a record. <laughs> so that was slightly off topic, but relevant here in Cook County where there is that Green Party ballot, you do have the ability to pull it. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah, folks talking about the Green Party needs to focus on local races first. The MWRD is about as local as you can get. I mean, there are smaller districts, but this is running for sewer board is about as local issues as you can possibly get. Um, and I think there's real change to be made there. I think we make a, a, a case for that change, and I hope we made it well tonight. Um, then we had some gun stuff, so some things that are not as directly related. Uh, money and politics. There was the comment about we really need to be paying attention to who is funding who. There are ways you can do that. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the Daily Herald just ran an article on campaign donations in the MWRD race. Uh, there is analysis that's available on our website. If you have not picked one up yet, one of these flyers, they say vote green March 20th on the front. They've got a little sample ballot with my name on it. Uh, they've got some issues on the back. Um, pick one of those up. There are URLs on there. There's a website uh, on there. If you go there, it does have a series of articles, and the most recent one was a breakdown of campaign finances. So you can take a look at some of the analysis we did on that. Uh, the information that we used for that came from a resource called Illinois Sunshine. You can go to illinoisunshine.org and find the uh, reported donations of any candidate committee in the state of Illinois. Um, Illinois Sunshine is the, the name of the website. So if you've never dived down that rabbit hole before and started following just how many of these Democratic candidates give to one another's committees to move the money around, it's fascinating. You'll be down in the basement with your cord board and your string saying, oh, I see it all, I see it all. Like, yeah. It gets very interesting when you get into it. Um, the Great Lakes Compact was mentioned, and the fact that we do have some protection on our water here, and we do. There are some protections on how far away we can ship that water, how, who has access to that water, things like that. But I think people need to be very, very aware of how real the real privatization is. There are already firms that have come to the city of Chicago and tried to get them to change city ordinance to make privatization of our drinking water in Chicago possible. They will try again. 
Um, there are folks who are interested in strengthening our city legislation to prevent that from ever happening. Um, Food and Water Watch is an organization that's done really good work on that. Um, I very much support a lot of the work they've done. They have talked to some of our aldermen. There is hopes to get an anti-privatization bill passed, uh, hopefully in the next cycle. Um, so pay attention to those options when they come, those opportunities when they come up. Um, and the folks who are saying, oh, well, you know, what, what, what can we do about this? Um, uh, someone mentioned media and outreach and things like that. The Green Party does write about these issues fairly frequently, but the reality is when a press release lands in a journalist's box and it says Green Party at the top, the odds of them opening it and doing anything with it plummet precipitously. But individual citizens can always write a simple letter to the editor on any of these issues, whether it's water privatization, whether it's electoral reform, and the editorial page is still one of the most read sections of the newspaper. So if that's something you're interested in doing and you're not sure how to go about it, reach out to us. The Green Party does media trainings. We do letter to the editor workshops, things like that. So just visit our website, ilgp.org. Uh, send an email to secretary at ilgp.org. That's not on the form, but you can find it on the website well enough. We'll get you hooked up. We will give you all the tools you need to get in touch with your local media as a citizen rather than as a representative of a party that they're already pretty committed to ignoring. There we go. I think that covers most of the things that have come up related to the MWRD race. So let me just summarize it for all of us here real quick. You do have opportunities to vote for Greens on the MWRD. Your first opportunity will be March 20th or the early voting for that primary. It will be, uh, you go into your polling place, you ask for a Green Party ballot. You can vote for the MWRD candidates who are ballot listed, but what you also need to do is on that vacancy of Bradford line, where there is only a write-in option, that's where you write in Jeffrey Cubbage. And if you're worried that you're gonna forget my name or you're not gonna know how to spell it, pick up one of these, take it with you. There's a little sample ballot printed right on the front. It has all the information you need. You can also go to the campaign website that's listed on there and it has a whole how to vote page. There's a video. We're trying to explain this very complicated situation in as many ways as we can to make it easy for you. So. Um, please vote for us on March 20th, and then when we have either four or hopefully five candidates on the ballot uh, in November, uh, vote for all five so that we can run the table and take majority control of the MWRD board. Okay, that's good. Why don't you go ahead and gavel us out? There's a little gavel there, just adjourn us. Take questions. I think that's it, right? Yep. All right. Thank you. Meetings adjourned. Thanks very much. Thank you. Anyway, thank you all for coming. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Get out of your way here.